Good morning, George Hepworth, Grover Park Consulting. Just how many records can I load into a Power Apps collection? I'm betting I can get at least 300,000. You want to see me try? Why does it matter how many records I can put into a collection? I'll take a quick look at the Lander Trail Foundation online searchable database and explain the context in which it might make a difference. Right now, the database has 1,929 titles in it. That's under the 2,000 maximum delegation limit. What's going to happen when we go over that 2,000 delegation limit, when we have 3,000 books in our library? How is that going to impact performance? How is that going to impact our ability to search and filter our records? In order to try to understand the impact of very large record sets in a Power Apps application, I set up a demo using a table from a database, a sample database that I have available. Actually, you can go to my website and download the database in which this table resides. Uh, I'll give you the link in the comments below. The employees table currently contains just over 300,000 employee records. These are dummy records, all made up bogus names. You can freely use them for stress testing, which is what I'm doing here. The application itself is a very simple one screen application in which I have a gallery and a form. The gallery gets its items from that table. I want to illustrate three different approaches to retrieving records for this gallery and the potential benefits and drawbacks to each method. I'm going to start out with the collection because that's the one that I intuitively went to when I started working on this thinking that's the most effective. It turns out that I actually can load 300,000 plus records into a collection in memory in this app in the browser. Turns out that I probably don't want to do that. We'll show you that and then I will come back in a second video, a follow-up video, in which we will look at the impact of using the direct source itself, the DBO employees table itself directly and a named formula based on that table. Notice that I am applying filtering in which we either are going to search an input field or we're going to filter against an impossible name. Why did I do that? When the application first loads, when any application first loads, when, as, as Access developers, this is one of our cardinal principles. We want to start out loading as few records as absolutely necessary. In other words, if we have a 300,000 record table, we're not going to bind or form directly to that table and try to load all those records at once. We're going to filter it somehow. This ensures that the query either has no records at all, because nothing will match that pattern for a name, or it will match the pattern of the name which we do enter, filtering only those names which match that pattern. This ensures the smallest number of the smallest possible number of records in our gallery. And of course the form on the right then will be filtered to just one single record. I'll show you how I build this collection. This has proven to be one of the more popular videos I've ever recorded. The, the ability to create collections with multiple thousands of records. And uh, this is an enhancement to the previous video. Uh, I'll explain that now because it is an enhancement and I think it is more elegant than the original. This timer at the beginning is only used for this video because I want to display on the form how long it actually takes to load 300,000 records into this collection. We want to refresh the employees table to ensure that whatever records are currently in that table and their current values in the fields in, those, in that table are the ones we're going to retrieve. We clear out any previous records that were in that collection. 
and then we initialize two helper collections. The first one is called call iterations. This is a calculation of the number of iterations required to recurse the entire record set in groups approximating the delegation limit. For example, 2,000 records in each iteration. So if we take the total number of records divided by 2,000, that will tell us how many times we have to repeat our call to that record source to bring in 2,000 records or less. And again, if your delegation limit is set lower, that will re be reflected in this calculation. The second, initial, the second helper collection we initialize creates a collection with one value for each iteration. So these are both initialized to 0 and 0. And then we start building our collections back against the current record set. We find the largest primary key value in our table. We set this variable equal to that value. The assumption here, excuse me for that, the assumption here is that the largest, highest primary key value in that table will always be at least as great as the number of records in the table. If there are gaps in the sequence, of course, the actual number of records will be less than that maximum value, but it can't be more. So this will ensure that our calculation includes all possible records. Emp number or employee number is the primary key in this table. Also note that this assumes our primary key value is a number. If you use a string value or a GUID for your primary key, all bets are off, this won't work. Once we know how many possible records we have, we figure out how many iterations, how many times we're going to have to loop through that total table to retrieve our records 2,000 at a time or the, delegation, the current delegation limit in each pass. That is a division of the highest possible value divided by our delegation. This is a named formula that I set to 2,000 for this application. We round that up so we're working with a whole number. And we add one. This is a safety measure to ensure that we're always past the end of the records. Then we create a, a collection using the sequence function over the CVAR iterations plus one. This creates a collection with the numbers one through the maximum number of iterations we have to go through plus one. Again, ensuring that we're past the end of the record set in all cases. Then we build a collection called iterations. The first one is a counter. Then we collect the first item in that iteration. This will be the first primary key value for that current 2,000 record iteration. Then we collect the last item number. Uh, let me show you how that actually might work. For example, uh, we, there are a there's our value column. The first item is the primary key value 1. The last item in that iteration is the primary key value 1993. The second iteration, and I can, I can adjust this to show 1 through whatever the number is. Uh, I didn't bother to do that because this is not really used in our calculation. This number reflects the fact that our actual highest primary key value is greater than the number of records in the table. And our math results in a span over the iteration of fewer than 2,000 records. This is, again, a safety measure to ensure that we're always working within the margins available to us. And as you scroll down through there, with a 300,000 record table, you're going to have iterations of this sort. I won't go through that whole list because we don't really need to see that. You can figure it out by looking at it. The final step, once we have our iterations table, 
is to collect employees in groups. We use the for all function to collect employees in groups or iterations, starting with the first item in that iteration through the last item. So the first pass through will be item one through item 1,993. We sort by columns, we, we initially sort our collection alphabetically by last name, first name. That ensures that we don't have to worry about it later if we're going to use it, that it's sorted in the proper order. It will come in sorted the way we want it. I specify here that I want to see all of the columns in that table in my collection. This is probably not necessary, but I have a kind of a belt and suspenders safety guy, I want to ensure that I get exactly what I'm looking for. Once the collection has completed, and it will iterate through each of those items until it reaches the last item in the table, we stop the timer, and that will tell us how long it took to cre create that collection. Here's our first big test, and this will help us understand why I can put 300,000 records into a collection but the first example of why I probably do not want to do that. Run the application. I'll hit the collect button, which will start that process I just explained. It brings in the first set of items. You'll notice that this incrementing in 1900 record chunks. I'll pause while it completes. OK, it's completed. We have 300,024 records in our collection. It took 2.37 minutes, or 142 seconds. How many of your users is going to sit and wait two and a half minutes, two and a third minutes, for their application to load and be available to use? Most, most users are going to start complaining after a three or four second delay. Right off the bat, you can see, yes, it's possible to load 300,000 records into a collection and have them available. Let's do a little bit of searching. I know that this is the last, last name in my collection. Oh. And it took a few seconds but my search feature filtered that entire 300,000 collection and brought back 148 employees whose last name is ZYKH. Change that to AMO. And we're getting an even larger, longer delay this time. There are 148, and I'm sure it's going to update that in a second. AMO has 1,250. As you can see, the gallery updating slowly. Again, this illustrates that, yes, once I get the 300,000 records into my collection, I can filter through that entire collection, uh, 1,250 at a time, 148 at a time. I'm going to do something really brave and just filter on the letter T. This is going to take rather a long time. It turns out that there are 128,908 records in my employee table, which have the letter T either in the first or the last name or both. If your application requires you to have this kind of full record set available, perhaps a collection like this is possible. It's certainly not performant, but at least I've demonstrated that you can do so. In reality, of course, most of us would never want to do that. We're always going to want to keep it to the minimum number of records possible. 
And by filtering it against an impossible value, I ensure that that's the case. I think that'll wrap up my first demo here in this uh, two-part series on uh, working with large record sets. In the second demo, I'll come back and uh, I'll illustrate what happens when I use a named formula and when I use simply the raw underlying direct table itself. If you like what you see, don't forget to hit the subscribe button, the like button, and keep your, eye, keep your eyes open for the next installment. Thank you.